الحمد لله يا رب العالمين له جميع خلقه كما يحبه ويرضى اللهم صل على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأكرة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا يسر ولا تعسر وتمم بالخير فبك نستعين يا فتاة سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قلنا لك إن ربك أحاط بالناس وما جعلنا الرأي التي أريناك إلا فتنة للناس والشجرة الملعونة في القرآن ونخوفهم فما يزيدهم إلا تقيانا كبيرا وإذ قلنا للملائكة اسجدوا لآدم فسجدوا إلا إبليس قال أأسجد لمن خلقت طينا قال أرأيتك هذا الذي كرمت علي لئن أخرت لئن أخرتني إلى يوم القيامة لأحتنك ذريته إلا قليلا قال ذهب فما تبعك منهم فإن جهنم جزاءكم جزاء موفورا واستفزز من استطعت منهم بصوتك وأجلب عليهم بخيلك ورجلك وشاركهم في الأموال وشاركهم في الأموال والأولاد وعدهم وما يعدهم الشيطان إلا غرورا إن عبادي ليس لك عليهم سلطان وكفى برمك وكيلا ربكم الذي ربكم الذي يسجي لكم الفلك في البحر لتبتغوا من فضله إنه كان بكم رحيما وإذا مسكم الضر في البحر ضل من تدعون إلا إياه فلما نجاكم إلى البر أعرضتم وكان الإنسان كفورا أفأمنتم أن يكسف بكم جانب البر أو يرسل عليكم حاصبا ثم لا تجد لكم ثم لا تجد لكم وكيلا First of all, we give our praise and our thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For all the favors and bounties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed on us. And we send salat and salam on his last and final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As you continue with the tafsir of Surah Al-Isra, we are currently on verse 60. In this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لَكَ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ أَحَاطَ بِالنَّاسِ We said to you that your Lord encompasses humanity. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الرَّؤْيَ الَّتِي أَرَيْنَاكَ إِلَّا فِتْنَةً لِلنَّاسِ We did not make the vision we showed you except as a test for the people. وَالشَّجَرَةَ الْمَلْعُونَةَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ And he says, and the tree cursed in the Quran. We frighten them, but that only increases their defiance. So in this ayat, verse 60, in our last discussion, as we were on verse 59, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that the only reason 
He did not send these miracles that unbelievers were asking for. As you mentioned that they came and they were asking the Prophet wasallam, why don't you make the mountain of Safa into gold for us? Prophet Jesus wasallam, did so much, he brought the dead back to life. Another prophet, he was given the ability to control the wind. So we want as a means of you proving that you are a prophet, we want you to ask Allah to change the mountain of Safa into gold. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the only reason we <coughs> did not do that, we did not respond to them, we did not give them the miracle they are asking for, is because of past experience. And he uses the word, كَذَّبَ awalun. The previous nations in the past, they asked for similar things. They asked for things which are impossible, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed them that those things which are impossible, but yet they still deny it. So if they are, they are asking for the mountain of Safa into gold, if Allah was to place or to make the mountain of Safa into gold, they are still going to deny it. So Allah says it's past experience. He already knows what they are going to do. And this is why he did not make the mountain of Safa into gold. And then he says, وَآتَيْنَا ثَبُورَ النَّاقَةَ مُبْسِرَةً فَظَلَمُوا بِهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we had given the she camel, the pregnant she camel to the people of Thamud. And the reason Allah is mentioning the people of Thamud because the Arabs, they were well aware of the people of Thamud. When the Prophet sallallahu was traveling to go in the battle of Tabuk, he passed by the people of Thamud. So which means they weren't that far away. So they were able to remember of the story of Thamud and what took place. So Allah says, we had given them a pregnant she camel coming out of a rock, something which was impossible. But after that, they still denied. And the instruction is, do not touch the animal, do not touch or hamstring the pregnant she camel. And yet they still went and they do the exact thing they were, they were <coughs> prohibited from doing. So Allah says, this is the reason, again, كَذَّبَ بِهَا الْأَوَّلُونَ Allah has experience. This is not the first nation, this is the last nation. So years upon years, Allah has been experiencing the nature of mankind, of when He was to send miracles. And at the end, Allah says, وَمَا نُرْسِلُ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا تَخْوِيفَ Which is the ayat that we had to cut short in this part, because of time, Allah says, وَمَا نُرُسِلُ بِالْآيَاتِ We do not send these ayats. Ayat, when you hear about ayat, we think about verses of the Qur'an. Verses of the Qur'an also means ayats. So you have an ayah, which is singular, and ayat, which is plural, verses. But ayat could also mean a sign. So when Allah speaks about the sign, looking at the heavens, the earth, these are considered to be signs. Also when Allah speaks about the adab that He strikes people with, He also uses the word ayat. So the word ayatun could mean verse of the Qur'an, it could mean a sign that was given, as well as it could mean one of the adab or punishment. So Allah says, وَمَا نُرُسْرُ بِالْآيَاتِ We do not send these signs. Illa taqwifa, except as a means of fearing mankind. To bring about fear in the heart of man. So that when they see it, they will wake up and they will turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will, they will have a lesson. <coughs> they would be able to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will be able to pay heed towards what they were supposed to do. It is mentioned that during the time of Ibn Mas'ud anhu, there was an earthquake in Kufa. And when this earthquake shook, Ibn Mas'ud anhu, he says, Ya Yohannas, inna rabbakum yasta'atabikum. He says, O oh people, your Lord is rebuking you. So he's telling them, the earth has shaken. The earthquake, and we are seeing a lot of earthquakes. We see what the earthquake that occurred only recently with Turkey and Syria. So as the there was this zilzal, the earthquake, 
He says, Allah is rebuking you, so pay heed. Fa'atibuhu. So you should pay heed in your actions. Look at yourself and see how much you're disobeying Allah and try to fix that before a greater earthquake was to come to you. So when something like this happened is a form of open up, opening up your eyes. During the time of Umar bin al-Khattab, there was also an earthquake. And when the earth shook Umar, he says, Ahdathtum wallahi. Says, I swear by Allah, you have changed. Speaking to the companions of the Prophet, he says, Wallahi, you have changed. You're no longer like the, the during the time of the Prophet. That eagerness, that amount of devotion that you, you had during the lifetime of the Prophet, I'm not seeing that much again. You have changed. And he's saying this to the companions. Imagine if he was to see us. Who are claiming that we are following Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So he has he said to them, "You have changed," and he says, "Lain aadat laf alanna wa laf alanna." Says, "If the earth was to stop shaking and return to normalcy, then I will do so and so." Which means you will put things in place to ensure that you are still in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa taala. There's a hadith in both Bukhari and Muslim where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "In the shams wal qamar ayatani min ayatillah." He says, "The sun and the moon are two signs from Allah subhanahu wa taala." Wa inna huma la yan kasifani li mauti ahdin wa la li hayatihi. Says, and the eclipse of the sun or the moon. They do not eclipse because of someone's death. They do not eclipse because of someone's birth. We know when the Prophet Sallallahu son Ibrahim passed away. At the same time there was that, this eclipse. And some of the, the people started to say it is eclipsing because of the death of the son of the Prophet Sallallahu But the Prophet Sallallahu says it doesn't eclipse the sun or the moon. There are signs from Allah. They don't eclipse because this one is going to die, or this one just died, or because this one born. So there are signs of Allah. He says, Walakin, Walakin Allah Azza wa Jal yukhawifu bihima ibadah. says, Allah uses them to fear His servants. To fear His servants. So whenever there was an eclipse, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi do? They didn't stay up to see how nice it's going to look. This is what we do. Whenever we see an eclipse, we try to buy all the fancy glasses so that we can stare at it to see how nice and we want to take out pictures. When the Prophet Sallallahu saw eclipses taking place, he would rush towards praying Salat. That's why there's Salat al-Kusuf. There's Salat of Eclipse. <coughs> that you pray because you do not know if Allah is using this eclipse and then Allah uses it to destroy to cause a, some sort of destruction. As an eclipse, maybe Allah could cause the earth to quake again. Allah could cause some sort of disaster. Uh, Why is you in this, in this kind of way of wanting to, to see how it looks? You die without being in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why it is prescribed. A son of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he used to perform the Salat al Kusuf at the time of eclipse. He says, Wa ina ra'aytum zarik fafzau ila dikrihi wa duaaihi wa istikfarihi. He says, Whenever it eclipses, fafzau, which means you should hasten towards the remembrance of Allah. You should stay inside, make your dhikr. You should hasten towards the dua, asking Allah to forgive you. We stick far, we should hear said in the forgiveness of Allah. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, Ya Ummah to Muhammad. He says, O Ummah of Muhammad. Wallahi law ta'lamuna ma a'lamu la dahiktum kalilan wa la bakaytum kathira. He says, O Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you know what I know, Again, if you were to know what I know, you would laugh less and cry more. 
You will laugh less and cry more if you really understand your journey going to Allah. If you really understand what is going to happen on the Day of Judgment. If you really understand what is that bridge over the fire of Jahannam, maybe you really understand it. If you really understand standing in front of the scale and waiting to see if it is going to weigh, your good deeds is going to outweigh your bad deeds or your bad deeds is going to outweigh. If you really know, and the Prophet is telling you in such a way because he was able to see. As we're going to see in the next ayat, which the, the ayat which we are on, which is verse 60. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make mention again of the, the mi'raj, <clears throat> which was the ascension of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So we are doing the surah of al-Isra, which in the beginning we talked about al-Isra wal mi'raj. Verse 60 also, this speech about al-mi'raj. So why is verse 1 was talking about the Isra, we're going to see verse 60 telling us something about what took place on the Mi'raj itself, on the Ascension. So he says, if you really know, then you will laugh less and you will cry more. We move on, we, we are now to the ayat which we are supposed to begin today, which is verse 60. Allah says, But if kulna laka in the rabbaka ahata minnas, and when we said to you, with kulna laka, so the address here now is to the Prophet. With kulna laka, so when we said to you, in the rabbaka ahata minnas, your Lord encompasses humanity. Your Lord encompasses humanity. <coughs> Which means <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have power over mankind. <sighs> Human beings cannot hurt or harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has full control of all human beings. Allah can do whatever He wants without anybody questioning Him. That is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So, Allah is addressing the Prophet ﷺ. When the surah was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ was still in Makkah. And it was the last days in Makkah. Because when you <coughs> retract to where or when the Isra and the Mi'raj took place, it was very close to before he migrated towards Medina. And the last few years were even harder on the Prophet ﷺ. And this was the time where they were trying to even assassinate him. Because before the Isra and the Mi'raj, the Prophet Sallallahu main support passed away, which was his uncle and his wife. He so don't have the support of his uncle again, who was the leader of the tribe, the Banu Hashim tribe. And no one was able to overpower him in decision. <coughs> Because the entire tribe of Banu Hashim, even though majority of them do not believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they would stand up for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he's a part of the tribe. That is how they operated. So not because I don't believe in him, I'm going to allow another tribe to harm him or hurt him. No, they were not like that. They will always listen to the leader of the tribe. And the leader of the tribe was the Prophet Sallallahu uncle. So as long as he was alive, they couldn't touch the Prophet Sallallahu They didn't even think about killing the Prophet Sallallahu But as the leader passed away, he was no more. The new leader now would have been taken aside of the other tribes to go ahead and get rid of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And this is, this is why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given the command by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to migrate because you are actually waiting to kill him now. So <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> is saying to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam during those hard days of his life. Allah is saying to him that Allah have control over everyone. Even if they come right next to you with a sword to kill you, they can't kill you. Because 
the Prophet is in a position where he's the minority. He's up against all, or you could say, majority of the people of Mecca. He and his few companions. And among the companions, many of them were from amongst the poor. They had no say. So he is in a state where, <clears throat> as being a human being, he's going to be afraid. It is just natural, human nature. When you're going up against hostile people and you don't have support, he definitely is going to have that sort of feeling, you know what? At any time they could take my life. At any time they could hurt me. So Allah is saying to the Prophet Sallallahu in the Rabbaka Ahata Binnas. Allah has full control of the people. As long as I tell you remain there, nobody can harm you. Nobody can touch you. Allah will protect you. And Allah did protect him. No one was able to kill him. He stood right there in front of him and he walked right in front of them. And they were not even able to see him. So this is what Allah says. Allah encompasses the people. Which is a, a lesson for us as well. As long as Allah is protecting us, then we have nothing to worry about. As long as we do what Allah asks us to do. And what does Allah tell us to do? Allah tells us to pray. Allah says, whoever prays, then you have this covenant with Allah that Allah is going to protect you. <clears throat> and if Allah is protecting you, then you have nothing to worry about. So Allah continues, He says, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا رُؤْيَ الَّتِي أَرَيْنَاكَ Allah says, we did not make the vision we showed you, except, إِلَّا فِتْنَةً لِلنَّاسِ Except as a test for the people. Except as a test. So we're talking about the Mi'raj. Alhamdulillah, next week we have the Mi'raj program as well, which is good that this ayat comes right around the same time. <coughs> the Mi'raj. So we back again with the Mi'raj. We went through maybe two or three sessions going through the details of the Mi'raj. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alluding here now, He says, the ru'ya allati arainaka, the vision that we showed you. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as you mentioned, he was going for the Israel, he was seeing many things, he witnessed a lot of things, as he was going up into the heavens, he saw a lot of things, as well as he was able to see paradise, he was able to see the fire of Jahannam. So he saw many things. So Allah says, these things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showed you in the Mi'raj is a test for people. It is a test for the people. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came down for the Mi'raj, and he informed Ummu Hadi because he was staying in the house of Ummu Hadi how his wife had passed away. So as he's in the house of Ummu Hadi, he was excited that you know what, I just saw Jannah, I just saw Jahannam, I just saw the heavens. <coughs> So as he was excited, as soon as Ummu Hadi and him met up, he mentioned the whole incident of Ummu Hadi. Ummu Hadi, she believed. But here, her advice to, to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, her advice to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody about what you just told me. I believe. But I don't think anybody else is going to believe that. Don't tell nobody. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't keep it to himself. He still went and informed the people <coughs> of the journey he took. Because as we mentioned while going through the Mi'raj, we saw that it was impossible as we could use in our language. It was something impossible. If we use our minds and our intelligence, we're going to say this is a makeup story. Because in a day and age where there are no vehicles, no cars, 
no trains, no airplane. When you take a journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, you take one month, 30 days to go, and then you take 30 days to return. And then he's saying, he did not only do that in a part of the night, but he did that whole 60 days journey in part of the night, as well as he went till up in the heavens, come down back. Anybody who tried to think and say, this, is this real or not? You're going to say, uh -uh, I, I, I don't believe this. This is impossible to do. But if you have Iman, it was a test. So there were some of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, who had just accepted Islam. And as soon as they heard about this whole Bi'raj, they rejected Islam. They turned away the apostate. So Allah is saying it was a test because they now entered into Islam and hearing this impossible story. The Iman wasn't strong enough as yet. So as they hear this story, they're not looking at what I really believe in. They're looking at what is making sense. And at that moment, it is not making sense. To be logical, it is not making sense. It is something impossible to the mind. But as long as you have true Iman and you really believe in Allah, if you, and this is, this is about our true belief in the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you believe in the power of Allah, then it is not impossible. And this is why as Muslims we can accept it wholeheartedly because we understand how powerful Allah is. But if you don't understand how powerful Allah is and you sit back and you're trying to analyze it and think, no, no, this, this ain't making sense. And this is why even some commentators, because it is not making sense, they even went to the opinion and said, this was a dream, it wasn't physical. Some scholars even went to that, because why? They were trying to analyze it. But here Allah, so we, we went through that discussion when we, we started this surah and we looked at in the ayat itself, Allah proved that it was not a dream. It was done physically, both body and soul. He took the Prophet But he said it was done as a fitna lindas, as a test for man. So the newly accepted who just embraced Islam, many of them left. The unbelievers now, after hearing this, <coughs> You would have expected they would have, they would have, they would have disbelieved even more. They would have increased in disbelief, which did happen. They were very happy hearing this. Abu Jahl, when he heard this, it was like a happy news was given to him. That Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said he went to Jerusalem and he went up in the heavens. He was very happy because. They were saying, you know what, today we can discredit Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, today. There is nothing else that we could have really discredited him with. Everything we tell the people, they're going to say, no, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not like that. He's speaking the truth. But will I let me tell them about this today? And this is why the first person he run to tell was Abu Bakr al anhu He went to Abu Bakr al anhu and he says, did you hear what your friends are saying? <clears throat> because to Abu Jahal's mind, he's thinking to himself, when I tell Abu Bakr this, this is the Prophet Sallallahu's closest friend. If I can take away Abu Bakr from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know how great achievement that is? So he was feeling, yes, I'm going to go and tell Abu Bakr. So he went to Abu Bakr. And he said to him, you heard what your friend is saying. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he says, if he said that, I believe. If he said that, I believe. And this is how we as Muslims should be. As long as Allah says something, we must believe. As long as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says something, we must believe. Even if we can't analyze it. There are many things that you don't have, you don't know the wisdom of. There might be many laws in the Quran and many people start to ask you why Allah 
said this, why Allah give down this rule? You don't have to know why Allah give, set down that rule. Your job is only believing and following the laws of Allah. This is what, that this is what, that is our job, to just believe and follow what Allah, not to find out or to make sense of everything. Because as long as it is coming directly from Allah, for example, the Mi'raj, the Mi'raj is not only something found in the Hadith, but we are seeing it is in the Quran. Say so if someone wants to disbelieve in a Mi'raj, they are not a Muslim. If you disbelieve in a Mi'raj. Because Allah is telling you of the Mi'raj here. So you actually disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to believe in the Isra and the Mi'raj. So Allah said it was a fitna for the people. It was a fitna. So much of them left. And then he says, وَالشَّجَرَةَ الْمَلْعُونَةَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ And he said, the a coarse tree in the Qur'an or the coarse tree in the Qur'an what is the coarse tree in the Qur'an? <coughs> not a guava tree or a mango tree I don't really have a coarse tree in the Qur'an which tree is mentioned a lot in the Qur'an? So he says that, that is why he does not say the coarse tree. He says the coarse tree fell Qur'an. Shajrat al-mal'unata fell Qur'an. Which tree is coarse in the Qur'an? And that tree that is coarse in the Qur'an is the tree of the zakum. Allah talks about the zakum. And the Zakum is, is mentioned, hinted in many ayats of the Quran. Right? And this is one of the ayats which it is hinted to. But there are four ayats of the Quran where the name Zakum is there. And this is the tree that is in the fire of Jahannam. The only tree in the fire of Jahannam. Remember, the fire of Jahannam is filled with fire. So you're not going to have a white plantation of many trees. But you have Allah is going to place one tree in the fire of Jahannam, which is known as Shajrat al Zakum, which is the, the tree of the Zakum. <coughs> the roots of this tree is, <coughs> it is mentioned, it is in the heart of hell, of the fire of hell. The roots of this, the, the tree of the Zakum. The food that is going to be grown on the tree of Zakum. <coughs> It is not going to have any good taste. It is not going to nourish. And it is going to have a lot of thorns. So as you bite into it and you eat it, it's not that you're going to have a pleasant taste. At least you still, you know, you taste something nice and sweet. No kind of good taste. And <clears throat> with the thorns on it, as it goes down your throat, it is going to be peeling to even try to swallow it. But the, the Jahannamis, as they're in the fire of Jahannam, they're going to be thirsty. <clears throat> they're going to be hungry. So they're going to be thirsty, they're going to be hungry. And if you're thirsty or hungry, you're going to look for something to eat. You're going to look for something to drink. They had no parlay. So you can go and sort for a parlay to get something to drink or to eat. So you're in the fire of Jahannam. And again, these are things which there's a lot of imagery <coughs> that you can try to picture, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing this for you to fear Him, for you to understand what it is like in the fire of Jahannam. So that when you, you have that in your mind, you know what, let me just leave out a salat. You change that mind one time if you really know about that tree in the fire of Jahannam, the tree of Zakum. So they are hungry, they are thirsty, fire is born in them from all sides. And if fire born you, your skins are going to be melted. So you see someone get born in a fire. We see people born victims. We see how they look. We see what happened to their body. Try to picture that in the fire of Jahannam. The skin has been melted. And everything is, as it melts, it is going to drop on the ground. And it's not for you, from you alone. 
the amount of people because the fire of Jahannam is going to have more inhabitants than Jannah. Because as Allah says, only a few people are going to be believers. So majority of human beings are going to be in the fire of Jahannam. So everybody is there. Flesh is dropping off. You're thirsty. And as Allah says, every time their flesh burns, Allah puts on back new flesh on them to burn again. <coughs> so <coughs> they're hungry, they're thirsty. Allah tells us about Tinatul Qabal. Tinatul Qabal, which is known as Usaratul Ahlinar, which is the juice. Usar, the word Asiran, which is juice, that you squeeze. So the juice of the people of Jahannam, which is called Tinatul Qabal, that is the brand name, Tinatul Qabal. It is as you dip up blood, pus, and the, the the material that come off from your body, dipping up that to drink. That is what they have to drink. And then, as you're hungry, when you drink that, you don't want that again, but you're forced to drink because of the thirst. And then you're hungry, nothing to eat. No bread, no roti, no rice, nothing to eat. But then, you look up and you see, there's this tree in Jahannam, the coarse tree. And you're seeing fruits on it. So definitely, first thing will come to your mind. This is the only thing to eat. You're going to hold on to the fruits of Zakum. Are you going to take a bite? And as you eat from it, we know what is going to happen. So, <coughs> so Allah says, this is what was shown to the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu saw all of that. When he went for the Mi'raj, he saw the punishment. What I'm telling you here now, we're just trying to have an image of it. But for, the, for, for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he actually was there watching at that punishment. Seeing it as how we were, could watch a movie and see, imagine Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's seeing this what I'm talking about, he's seeing it happening there. And this is why he was so fearful. And that's why he says, if you know what I know, you're going to laugh less and cry more. If you really know. So Allah showed him it. <clears throat> so, and then Allah says, Allah says, we frighten them. <clears throat> we are seeing the Quran. There are verses of the Quran where Allah speaks about Jannah. He talks a lot about Jannah, about the food of Jannah, the luxuries of Jannah, the comfort of Jannah. And the reason Allah uses a certain amount of the Quran to mention these favors that are going to be there in Jannah is a form of encouraging us to do good to get Jannah. So that when we are praying, as we pray to Allah, we, we have a purpose of praying. Why is your main purpose should have been to get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? <clears throat> but yet if your prayer is not to get the pleasure of Allah, and it is you're on a, a lower task, as you can say, or a lower bar, that you're praying because I want paradise. It is also right. Your salat is still going to be accepted. So one is, you can pray, I pray because I want Allah to be happy with me. Your salat is accepted. Next day, Allah can say, I pray because see that janda day, I want to go in that janda. So I'm not going to miss no salat because I want, to, I want my palace in janda. There's a lot to do to have that type of intention as well. And this is why Allah mentioned all these beautiful things about janda. But then, you're going to see certain ayats now that, for example, like this one where you're going to hear about the fire of Jahannam. And why is, many times we don't like to hear them? Because we like positive things. And this, for some, might feel, you know what? This is something kind of negative. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
gives you a little hint of what to expect in the next life, both of ease and comfort as well as punishment. So as to protect you, Allah is doing this to protect you, <clears throat> so that whenever you're planning to disobey Allah, you're going to reflect back and say what, nah, it not, it's not worth it. You see that fire of Jahannam, this little enjoyment, not worth it. Best I give up this little enjoyment that I'm going to get in disobeying Allah and try to get my paradise or be protected from the fire of Jahannam. So Allah says, وَنُخَوِّفُهُ In this ayat, Allah says, the reason is so that we will fear them. Bring about some fear in the hearts of both our believers as well as the believers. Because as believers, we also need fear. As last week we talked about Al-Iman Bayna Raja Wal Khawf. Iman is between hope and fear. Which we need to have both of them. We need to have fear as well as we need to have hope. So Allah says, Fama Yaziduhum illa tuhiyan and kabira. Allah says, but that only increases their defiance. That only increases their defiance. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the unbelievers, the unbelievers of Makkah. <coughs> Allah is saying that they could hear the whole Quran. They could hear about hell. Allah might even could even show them hell as well. And still they're still going to remain Tugyan and Kabira. They're still going to remain rebellious. They're still going to transgress. Because their mind was already set that not I am not going to be a Muslim. So be it whatever they were feared with, they held on to that and they have some people even up to today. Whatever their ideals and their values, they hold on to that, even though they might they, they, other than it, it's better than it. They prefer to hold on to what I believed in in the past. Because so and so used to do it, and I want to continue to do it. So Allah says, for our believers, this is not going to touch them. And many times you, you talk certain things to unbelievers, and they just shake their head and they just go on in disbelief. They, they don't want to hear about what the fire of Jahannam is. They don't want to hear about Jannah. <coughs> move on to the next ayat. We only have a few more minutes. <coughs> so we'll just touch on the next ayat and we'll <coughs> go more in details with the ayat in our next class. So now from verse 6 to 1 until 6 to 5 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of the story of Adam alayhi salana. Adam alayhi salam and Iblis. We have dealt with this story many times. We have dealt with it in Surah Baqarah. We have dealt with it in Surah Al-A'raf. We dealt with it in Surah Al-Hijr. So many surahs we did before. We dealt with this subject of Adam alayhi salam and Iblis. So Allah says in this ayah verse 61, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ سَجَدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ so Allah says, when we said to the angels, اُسْجُدُوا adam Prostrate Adam. فَسَجَدُوا Allah says, they all prostrated. إِلَّا Iblis, Except Iblis. قَالَ أَأَسْجُدُ لِمَنْ خَلَقْتَ تِينَ In other ayahs that we did, Allah says, Abba was takbar. He refused and he was too arrogant. <laughs> this ayat, however, Allah says that he replies, as liman tatina. Should I prostrate to that one who was created from clay? So he is questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah gives him a command to prostrate. And again, Iblis is not an angel. I heard some of the unbelievers up to today amongst the Christians, they believe that <coughs> Shaitan was a, is 
the fallen angel. But as from our beliefs as Muslim, Shaitan is not an angel. So he's not, as they could say, that the fallen angel. He's not a fallen angel. He was from amongst the Jinnats. But because of his closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah had him, as you can see, in charge of instructing some of the angels. So when the command came, because he was given a, as you can say, a manager task, or a supervisor, as you could say, over the angels, the command had also included him. So he was also included in this command that you need to prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, as you mentioned before in previous classes, that as Adam alayhi salam was being created, shaitan would come and he, because Adam alayhi salam was hollow. So shaitan would come and he would knock and say, what kind of thing is this? So he would laugh, literally laugh, at the creation of Adam, why Adam was being created. This by itself was, was a sign of, of his disobedience to Allah. That what is going to take place coming down for them. So he did not like <clears throat> that Adam alayhi salam is coming on the scene as you can see and going to take away his position. Because he felt, you know what, I if somebody had to prostrate, let them prostrate to me. Don't let me as a senior, more experienced guy here having to prostrate to this thing. This is his thinking. Not looking at who is given a command. So again, so it is a serious thing when we try to only use our akka and we try to analyze. Islam is yes, many places Allah says afala taqilun, I to use in your intelligence, but there's a lot involved in obedience. And that obedience means to obey in things that you understand and things that you do not understand. So he to himself, I am the senior here. You now created him. Why are you telling me to, to worship him? You're supposed to be telling him, hey look, see that one? See Iblis there, he in charge of all the angels, prostrate to Iblis. This is what Iblis wanted. So he denied, so look, look at his, his questioning. And in this surah you're going to see his disrespect for Allah. And the other surahs that mention this topic, this story, you don't see the type of disrespect Iblis was towards Allah. All you, all you see in those other instances Allah mentioned is that he just refused. But in this particular few ayats in Surah Tal Isra, you're going to see the manner of how he kept on, as, as we can say, back answering. You know, like a child back answer the appearance. That is the kind of attitude he was towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not recognizing that is Allah. He and you are not on the same field. You know, like, like when a child wants to, <clears throat> to be rude, and you ask the child, are we the same age? I am the father, you are the child. You don't have the right to question why I tell you to do so and so. But this is how Iblis wanted to behave with Allah. Just like a disrespectful child to a parent, that is how he wanted to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll close with, with his first bad attitude to Allah. He says, liman Should I prostrate to that one who was created from teen? So he is asking Allah, you tell me, why are you telling me that I must prostrate to something that is made out of clay? And inshallah, next class we're going to the next verse and we're going to see the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next verse, inshallah. So we close off. Yeah, so we close off, inshallah, in a, with a tafsir for tonight. Uh, inshallah, Friday coming, inshallah, uh, from the Larmin Jamaat, we'll be having our Miraj function, or actually a lecture that will be done by our Imam, Imam Yasin Fernandez. So, brothers and sisters who are on the Zoom that would like 
would like to connect via the Zoom, inshallah, the link will be sent out. And it is going to be the same time, Maghrib to Isha, on this Friday, inshallah. So with that, inshallah, we end up tonight. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, la sharu wa la ilaha illa anta, la staghfiruka wa natubi ilaik, subhan rabbika rabbil isati amma yasifun, wa salaman ala al-mursali wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin, as-salamu alaykum.